Hello, Reason and Theology fans. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by Dr. John Joy, returning guest. Dr. Joy, it is great to have you on. How are you? I'm doing well, Michael. Thanks so much. Good to be back with you. Apologies about my uh, webcam not working, so you just got to hear me without seeing me today. Sorry about that. <laughs> not a problem. I know this is going to be excellent either way. The content is is definitely there. You always deliver. So I'm excited about this. We're talking about your book. I want to put it on the screen here, and I'm also going to put a link to it uh, so y'all can check it out and purchase a copy on Amazon. It is On the Ordinary and Extraordinary Magisterium for jo from Joseph Kloiken, I think is how we pronounce him, to the Second Vatican Council. Is that how we pronounce his name? That's right. Yeah. Kloitkin. Kloitkin. Yeah. You know, there, there is so much to say here. Um, so many questions that I want to ask, but first let me preface it with this. So, you know, I'm working on uh, a dissertation, so I'm, I'm engaging your book and I've been reading it for a little while now and, but I've been reading it so intensely and so closely and making so many notes that I'm only on page 44 which is barely <laughs> past the introduction. Oh, man. <laughs> that is how engaged I, I, I am. Um, well, I, thank you. I'm glad I, to hear that. I've probably written notes on nearly every sentence that, that you've written. <laughs> and that almost sounds counterintuitive. Why, why don't you just read the book again? Well, I want to be able to have the notes keyword searchable. So if you make a, a, a point... I, I want to be able to find it in a keyword search so that it comes up. And there is so much, just the introduction alone <laughs> is worth the price of the book. Just the introduction. It, it's excellent because you, you go over the magisterium um, and I, and I think in a way for the average person, they can really not have a background um, when it comes to this topic, they can open it up to read the in introduction and have a good foundation and their understanding of the different organs in the magisterium, how it works, how to identify. Um, and then, of course, you you clearly lay out here's where you're going with your uh, with the book. But of course, this is based on your your dissert, your doctoral dissertation that you converted into a book, right? Yeah, that's right. So that was that was my doctoral dissertation, um, pretty nearly untouched. I mean, it was it was slightly you know edited again after defending the dissertation. Uh, before it was published, but uh, but yeah, that's it. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, if anybody wants to save a little bit of time, the introduction and the conclusion are really where where you can uh, where most of the I don't want to say most of the meat. I don't know how to. Uh, you can read the introduction and conclusion and walk away. The, right. the middle right. chapters are a lot more uh, trying to substantiate right. Uh, right by digging into the historical sources in a bit, trying to substantiate what I say in the conclusion and the introduction. So if you just want kind of the survey overview, you can definitely just read the, the beginning and the end. If you really want to dig into it, then uh, then I hope you enjoy the middle chapters. But it's some parts of it are kind of dense. Uh, well, the, well the, say, the introduction alone is worth the price of the book. And you have plenty of documentation in here a lot of sources are cited ju even just like i'm saying in, in in the introduction and i've been making notes of all of them and part of it is <laughs> you'll you'll reference something and i'll go and look it up and and, and start reading it as well so <laughs> i'm trying to make my way through the book while yeah, you're going through the sources that you've done your reading list can multiply exponentially with it just about any kind of academic work so it, it has, but this is one that I really want to focus on. There are other works of the Magisterium that I'm reading as well, but I'm not um, diving into them as I'm not writing as many notes. I'm not diving into it as carefully as I am your work, uh, the work of Dr. King. And then, of course, uh, the primary sources, you know, but as far as the secondary source, um, your work is extremely valuable so is um dr king's although i think that y'all y'all might have some disagreements um you know on some points here and there he and i do uh but i agree with you that his dissertation i have also found extremely valuable even if we don't agree about everything that's all right though that's that's the nature yeah. of academic work as well right, so I'm, right, I'm, right i'm pleased to hear uh that you're finding it helpful, Michael. I'm I'm really enjoying it. And you know one of one of the first questions that I wanted to ask you about and what's curious is the background to this question. Um, it, it's interesting. When I first reached out to you, 
I, I just knew that you did work on the magisterium. I'd never read uh, your your dissertation. I didn't know uh, what you wrote your dissertation on. I had just been told that uh, you did work on the magisterium. So I reached out to you and I had just asked you a question that I was curious about. And that is, um, is the Pope infallible? Well, can, can we talk about an infallibility in the ordinary magisterium of the Pope. I mean, we all recognize there's a fallible aspect to his ordinary magisterium, and we all recognize that there's an infallible aspect to his extraordinary magisterium. But then there are some who assert that he is infallible in some of his ordinary uh, teachings, if you will. So there's an infallible ordinary papal magisterium, according to some. And I reached out to you and just, you know, <laughs> randomly asked you, hey, wh what do you think about this? And it turns out that's what your doctoral dissertation is on. So <laughs> it's pretty pretty incredible the way that that yeah, worked. When you asked me that question uh, a couple years ago or whatever it was, I, I just assumed that you were asking me because you had read the book. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but so that, that's one of the questions that I wanted to ask here. You know, some have asserted, as have you, as you've noted in, in your work here, um, that the Pope can be infallible in, well, we can talk about an infallible ordinary magisterium, just as we have the ordinary and universal magisterium that can teach definitively. Some have, have asserted, well, there must be some kind of papal equivalent to that. We all know that there's the extraordinary conciliar magisterium, and that's equivalent to the extraordinary papal magisterium. And we all know that there are ordinary teachings of the magisterium, uh, whether in a council or by a pope. But if there's an ordinary and universal magisterium that's definitive, then some are saying, well, then there surely has to be something like that with a pope as well. What do you what, what do you think about that? So that is the question that drew me into the topic. Uh, it's the question that I ran up against when I was studying uh, papal infallibility for my licentiate thesis. Uh, and I ran into the controversy around the status of Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, uh, the Epstock letter of John Paul II on the reservation of priestly ordination to men. Uh, and there's controversy over whether, whether that's a statement of the extraordinary infallible papal magisterium or whether it belongs to the ordinary magisterium. And then a second level controversy of if it belongs to the ordinary papal magisterium, then does that mean it's not infallible or might it still be infallible? So that's what drew me into the question. Mm -hmm. the, the argument in favor of the idea of an ordinary infallible papal magisterium is a strong one on the surface, but I believe it breaks down. So preview my answer. I do not think that there is any such thing as an infallible ordinary papal magisterium or an infallible papal exercise of the ordinary magisterium. The argument that there is was was commonly made by a lot of the neo-scholastic theologians in the early 20th century. So in the time period between Vatican I, 1870, up to Vatican II, 1962, that sort of late 19, early 20th century neo-scholastic period in Catholic theology, many theologians made the argument that there is an infallible ordinary papal magisterium for exactly the reason you just laid out, which if you summarize it in a syllogism, which they usually did, uh, premise: the first premise would be that the Pope has the same infallibility that the church has. The Pope enjoys the same charism of infallibility that the church enjoys or that the bishops enjoy. And that's that's very easy to establish both from Pastor Eternus of Vatican I. Lumen Gentium asserts the same thing in Vatican II. So that premise seems very solidly established. Whatever infallibility there is in the church, the Pope can exercise it. The second premise is that the church can teach infallibly through two modes, the ordinary and extraordinary magisterium. We have that at least uh, implied in De Filios at the First Vatican Council, which speaks about the necessity to believe by divine and Catholic faith all those things proposed by the church to be divinely revealed, whether by solemn judgment or by the ordinary and universal magisterium which was clarified at Vatican I that that was speaking about the magisterium exercised by the bishops dispersed throughout the world. That's why it's called universal, ordinary and universal magisterium, where universal means uh, you, the bishops dispersed throughout the world. So if the bishops can exercise 
a double infallible magisterium, can exercise, can teach infallibly in a double mode, ordinary and extraordinary. And if the Pope has the same infallibility, just as much infallibility as the bishops, then he should also be able to exercise it in a double mode, ordinary and extraordinary. And that's it. So, so that's a very tight syllogism. It logically checks out. Both premises are well established in the major church documents of Vatican I and Vatican II. And yet, uh, <laughs> and yet we've had denials. Uh, there are just denials of that, of, of the conclusion from John Paul II, for example, in some of his Wednesday audiences, very clearly says that the Pope is only infallible when he exercises his extraordinary magisterium. Those were in some of his catechesis on the creed from the early 90s. Uh, and probably most clearly, uh, Lumen Gentium, uh, paragraph 16. No, sorry, uh, I'm confusing this with another question. Paragraph 25, which I wrote my dissertation on. Paragraph 25, Lumen Gentium. Uh, so I should remember that. It's been a couple years now. Uh, paragraph 25, Lumen Gentium, when it speaks about the magisterium exercised by the Pope when he's not speaking ex cathedra, refers to that classification of teaching in, the, in some of the notes um, from the drafters of the document refers to that, so not in the text itself, but in the conversation about that text at Vatican II, that was described as the non-infallible magisterium of the Pope. So at least according to the minds of the uh, drafters of Lumen Gentium, which they communicated to the bishops at Vatican II before they voted on it, the Pope not speaking ex cathedra is equated with the Pope not speaking infallibly. And the ex cathedra teaching is equated with the extraordinary magisterium. So there's no room left for this idea of an ordinary, infallible papal magisterium. So, so this was the genesis of my doctorate. So, so I, I wanted to examine uh, what was going on there. So if, if this argument in favor of it seems very logical and airtight, but the authority of... Uh, I mean, the general opinion of theologians to begin with, but also the authority of John Paul II at a fairly low level in Wednesday audiences, but I wanted to be respectful of that. And then Lumen Gentium uh, uh, is against that. I wanted to discover where, <laughs> I want to discover what was going on. Um, so my conclusion, which I try to present in the book, is that the the problem which causes that inconsistency is an equivocation on the term ordinary magisterium. That what Vatican I meant by ordinary magisterium is so different as to not really deserve the same term at all from what we often call the ordinary magisterium of popes, that there's no way to draw that logical conclusion. So let me try to just capture that in a second. So when Vatican I speaks of the infallibility, speaks of the teaching of the ordinary and universal magisterium as contrasted against the solemn judgments of the church. So Vatican I makes a distinction between the ordinary and solemn teaching of the church. My conclusion from, from the research here that, that you can look into in the book if you're curious, uh, is that that distinction was intended to be understood as a distinction between the infallible teaching of the church, which is explicitly contained in documents of the church, that's the kind of stuff we're used to thinking about as magisterial teaching. Documented ecclesiastical teaching. That was what they were thinking of as the solemn judgments. Infallible teaching contained in the documents of the ecclesiastical magisterium, popes, councils. By ordinary magisterium, they meant the infallible teaching of the church which is not directly or explicitly contained in the documents of the church, but is instead is contained in the oral preaching of the church or, in the, or implied in the liturgical practices of the church, or even just uh, clearly and explicitly contained in the pages of scripture or contained in the unanimous teaching of the fathers of the church. So kind of all these other ways 
that Catholic theologians have traditionally used for determining the truth of a doctrine in theology were wrapped into this term of ordinary magisterium. Because the idea was this, that if the church proposes that scripture is divinely revealed and scripture proposes that the Holy Family fled to Egypt, then we can draw the conclusion that the church proposes that the Holy Family fled to Egypt. Not only that the church proposes that, that the church proposes that as something to be believed as divinely revealed. And now that's the definition of a dogma, which we traditionally ascribe to infallible teaching. So we can say that it is a infallibly taught dogma of the Catholic Church that the Holy Family fled to Egypt, even though that has never been declared in an explicit solemn judgment of a document of a pope or a council. So that was what was originally meant by ordinary magisterium. Then the way that term is used in a lot of the 20th century, and I tried to I tried to dig into where this shift happened, but by the time you get to Pius XII, certainly, and the Second Vatican Council and afterwards, ordinary magisterium is also, it's still used in that sense, but it's also often used to mean the non-definitive teaching that is explicitly contained in the documents of the ecclesiastical magisterium. So, so the, the, the less authoritative statements of papal encyclical letters and things like that. What you end up with then is that the term ordinary magisterium is being used on the one hand to describe definitive but not explicit teaching. And on the other hand, it's also being used to describe explicit but not definitive teaching which means the same word is being used to describe two different things which are opposed to each other in a double respect. The only thing they have in common is that neither one of them is both explicit and definitive, and that's what characterizes the extraordinary magisterium. So by comparison with the extraordinary, they both look ordinary, but that would be very much like calling angels and apes by the same term, just because neither is a man. When you know, I have a couple of follow-up questions here. You 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 mentioned there the proposition that the Holy Family led uh, fled to Egypt. Of course, this is in Scripture, but I, as I understand it, you were you were saying that you know the Church has never explicitly, definitively proposed that. Is that correct? Oh, well, at least as far as I know, I don't remember having ever run across that I in an ecumenical right. council yeah. or a, or a ex cathedra right. people. So, is this the difference between? Um, De fide and then de fide et catholica, um, the the former being it's of the faith, but you know it's it's in the deposit of faith, but the latter being it's in the deposit of faith and the church has made a definitive judgment on it. Is is that the no? That's a slightly different distinction. Slightly so, different. So this is the distinction between de fide divina et catholica definita and de fide and de fide de, divina et catholica non definita so uh, there's doctrines of divine and catholic faith mm -hmm. defined there are defined mm -hmm. doctrines of divine and catholic faith okay defined means infallibly proposed by the extraordinary magisterium there are oh. also undefined dogmas of divine and catholic faith mm -hmm. which are still dogmas but proposed to us by the ordinary magisterium mm -hmm. the distinction you're making is more like uh, one that theologians traditionally made between a dogma which has been, so dogma of divine and Catholic faith is both contained in divine revelation and proposed by the church, either by ordinary or extraordinary magisterium. The de fide divina, but not catholica, is a doctrine contained in divine revelation, but not proposed by the church in any fashion at all. So that's more like, um, and not in any adequate fashion. So that's more like the Immaculate Conception in the fourth century. Right, right, it right. Wasn't, it's not just that it hadn't been defined. It wasn't even known and talked about. It wasn't in the preaching of the church. It wasn't in the liturgy of the church. Um, it was implicitly contained and later worked out. But that would be de fide divina. So de fide uh, divina versus de fide divina et catholica. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So de fide divina means by divine faith. Anything right. contained in divine revelation should be believed by divine faith. De fide divina et catholica means divine and Catholic faith, mm -hmm. meaning it's 
contained in divine revelation. And so we give it divine faith. It's also infallibly taught by the church. And so yeah. we give it the response of Catholic faith, which is the, the difference between those two is a whole nother dispute really, but it, it's, a, it's yeah. an ascent of the mind based on the authority of the church and God revealing right. as opposed to just the authority of God revealing. And then the question is, is there a significant difference between those? Well, you because might be unclear on what was is pr being proposed in scripture. So, I mean, the church might need to come and clarify. Oh, certainly. Yeah. yeah. So, so Joseph Clayton, who is the author that I, that I studied, mm -hmm. especially in the 19th century, uh, when he was discussing these things, he would say, like, yeah, exactly. Look, there's lots of things in Scripture that are not clear exactly mm -hmm. how they should be understood, and so we we don't we don't um, we don't assume that our own interpretations of these things are dogmas, and, yeah. we, and, and it, we wouldn't assert a dogmatic kind of stance on them without a clear judgment of the church. But his point was, there are some cases in Scripture. Right. He cites that Christians have a moral obligation to love their enemies. Yeah, yeah. That the poor in spirit are blessed. Those are pretty straightforward. <laughs> right, so he's You don't saying, need the church says, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you, if you say uh, Christians do not have a moral obligation to love their enemies, you would yeah. be a heretic. <laughs> right. You'd be a heretic immediately, even prior to a judgment of the church. Exactly. Uh, and, and the test case for that is Arius. It, exactly. The fathers of the church condemned Arius as a heretic prior to the Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. And, they did, and it, they did that on the basis of the ordinary magisterium of the church. So when you think, what is the ordinary magisterium of the church? It can feel a little bit vague and undefined, but, but the best illustration of it is, it is it is that means by which Athanasius and the other fathers of the church were able to receive uh, with, with total firm uh, faith, the doctrine of the divinity of Christ prior to the Council of Nicaea. And so how would that have been? It would have been through the apostolic preaching, through the tradition, through the liturgy, all of those means, uh, when you when you pool, put all those together, this is that's the ordinary magisterium. So it can feel hard to pin down, but I think that's a great illustration of it. I, yeah, and that that's a good point, and that's kind of where I was going to go with it, is because some are going to say that, well, you know, just be, well, the church hasn't infallibly defined it; it's not definitive in the church. Therefore, it's up for grabs. Not not exactly. Um, first of all, it could have been taught, like you said, by the ordinary magisterium, yeah. or it could just be something that's proposed um, in the deposit of faith, so de fide divina, as you were saying, and so uh, even without the church intervening and clarifying um you're still a heretic because scripture is clear on that proposition like the holy family fleeing to right. egypt for example if you were to deny right. that you don't need an ecumenical council for that right and what you said was exactly the historical origins of the development it was the historical impetus for the development of the church's teaching on this subject because in the middle of the 19th century there were uh a lot of theologians who were making exactly that claim you pinpointed. They were saying, okay, we accept everything that the church has infallibly declared, everything that the popes or the councils have infallibly declared. Uh, we'll believe that stuff, but everything else is up for grabs. That was exactly uh, the dogmatic minimalism, the idea that you only have an obligation to believe what has been defined it was exactly the problem that Joseph Clayton was addressing in his writings, but then that Pius IX was addressing in his uh, letter to Aslibenter to the Archbishop of Munich in 1863, and then which uh, Dei Filius at Vatican I was trying to address uh, with its paragraph about the obligation to receive whatever has been proposed by the church as divinely revealed, either by solemn judgment, meaning by the explicit declaration of popes or councils, or by the ordinary magisterium. Now, they didn't flesh out in the document what they meant by that. And so it and so it led, I think, to a lot of confusion and a lot of speculation and, and different ideas. And so I, I, I frankly think since then, almost since Vatican I ended, there's been uh, controversy and misunderstanding and differing views about what the ordinary magisterium means uh, with very little 
explanation of what it means from the church documents. So the church documents use the term, but but very barely uh, explain it. So it, it takes some digging, I think, to, to figure out what's being meant by by those terms in a in a given document. One last really quick follow up before we move to the next one. I think you had mentioned the catechetical lectures of John Paul II, and <clears throat> you mentioned that they they support your thesis. So, um, were you did you indicate that those were low level but magisterial uh, teachings? Yeah. So John, yeah. So John Paul II, you know, in his general audiences, like his his Wednesday audiences, he was giving catechesis on on a weekly basis for a lot of his pontificate. Theology of the Body, very famously, you know, kind of fall, falls into that category. Uh, but he did a lot of series of things. So the Pope giving a talk in St. Peter's Square, um, it, you know, it's still coming from the Pope in an official capacity. So I don't want to say it doesn't, I don't want to downplay it totally. Like it's not just equivalent. It still carries more weight than my, than my ramblings, right? It's magisterial. <laughs> it's magisterial in a, in a, in some sense, but it doesn't have the the degree of authority of right. something more formal like a papal encyclical, and certainly is, right. is, is not ex cathedra. Sure. So really, really low level, but as opposed to a, a papal flight interview, which would not be <laughs> magisterial, right? So yeah, yeah. we would say that's not magisterial at all. Is that is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, off the cuff interviews, I don't think we right. can count as magisterial at all. Thank God. Yeah, I'd agree with that one. Yeah. And also as opposed to, you know, a Pope writing as a private theologian like Benedict the uh, sixteenth did with his Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, exactly. Books. Yep. Yeah. So there's a there's a quite a few other questions that I had here, but you know, one of the things that you talk about in the uh, introduction that I thought was really, really, really helpful is you talk about the subject, objects, and acts of the different I, I guess the proper terminology is the organs in the magisterium, papal magisterium, conciliar, and then the ordinary and universal. Correct me if I'm in, using the terms in, uh, incorrectly there, but um, you know, you talk about the subject, objects, and acts of these, and I found those distinctions helpful. So if you could briefly introduce us to those concepts. Sure. Yeah. So this this is uh, I didn't invent this. By the way, this is a common sort of uh, well, I, I don't I won't I won't say it's a universal way of of describing it, but it's it's certainly a way that has been used in the past before that I found very helpful. And so that's also the way uh, I chose to describe it. Um, the subject, object, and act. So this follows a little bit uh, kind of Thomistic, scholastic terminology. So if you think, for example, of um, something like uh, sight in a human being, you have a power of sight. The, the power to see is, is, um, is a human power. Uh, the subject in which that power resides is the eye. The act uh, that corresponds to that is the act of seeing. And then the object is the thing that you're looking at. So that's that's just a common sort of uh, scholastic way of, of analyzing uh, something like this into its into its parts. So with the magisterium, the magisterium itself is a is a power of teaching. It's that power resides in a subject, and that would be the Pope and the bishops. So oftentimes people refer to the Pope and the bishops as the magisterium. That's not really correct. Uh, the magisterium is a power that resides in the Pope and the bishops, not exactly the same thing. So, so the subject is the Pope and the bishops. The act of the magisterium can be either ordinary or extraordinary, and the object of the magisterium is. Firstly, those things that are directly contained in divine revelation, and then secondarily, other things that are connected intrinsically to what is contained in divine revelation, so that the church has to be able to, to judge about them in order to safeguard or explain what's contained in divine revelation. So what's useful about those, uh, especially, is that in, in every case, there's a kind of... Um, uh, twofold distinction. So with the subject, we can talk about the Pope and the bishops. With the act or the exercise of the magisterium, we can talk about ordinary and extraordinary. And with the object, we can talk about primary and secondary, which, which is closely related, although not exactly the same, as the distinction between dogma and doctrine. 
Uh, so those terms are used interchangeably in a lot of uh, sort of popular colloquial Catholic speech, but of course there is a technical distinction between them. Dogmas are contained in the primary object of the magisterium directly in scripture tradition. Doctrines are often those things that are sort of at a second level of remove. They're connected to the dogmas, but not themselves directly contained in divine revelation. And then also the ordinary and universal magisterium also then has two acts, but they're not extraordinary and ordinary, as I understand it. Okay. What is the difference there? Okay, let me let me correct your terminology a little bit here. So so mm -hmm. the ordinary and universal magisterium, what's the best way to describe this? Okay. So given that schema that I just mentioned, the subject is Pope and bishops, the twofold mm -hmm. subject of the magisterium, the Pope and the bishops. The Pope, of course, is one of the bishops. Um, so those are not perfectly distinct. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you if you consider the Pope, he's just the Pope. So when the Pope says something or writes something, mm -hmm. there's no way to subdivide that in terms of the subject. You can subdivide it in terms of the object, what he's talking about. You can subdivide it in terms of the act, how definitively he's saying it or not definitively, but you can't subdivide it in terms of the subject because the Pope is just the Pope. With the bishops, you can subdivide the subject because the bishops can teach in a uh, unified, formal and explicit way through an ecumenical council when they all sign the same document so we can take a line from Lumen Gentium and say all the bishops teach this, right? Uh, but the bish bishops can also teach in their condition of being dispersed throughout the world, where they're teaching each individually in their own way through their uh, through their writings, through their catechisms, through their uh, through their sermons, through their decisions. And when we have the consensus of the bishops teaching in that mode, that's when we talk about the ordinary and universal magisterium. So, so the bishops, the, the bishops as subject of magisterium, we can talk about, uh, this is where the terminology gets confusing and ambiguous though, right? Because we can talk about a kind of ordinary mode of the bishops teaching where they're dispersed throughout the world and the extraordinary mode where they're gathered in council but then, yeah. but then even when they're gathered in council, uh, there's still a distinction between their, when they teach definitively yeah. in a conciliar yeah. judgment or definition and when they teach authentically, right. but not definitively. So, so the, the, let's say the, the lower level non-infallible teaching contained in Vatican II is ordinary in its, um, it's ordinary in its, mode of exercise as being non-definitive, but it's extraordinary in its um, source from the bishops being united in council. In the subject? Yeah, right. From It's it's an extraordinary condition of the bishops to be all together because ecumenical councils happen relatively rarely, right? Yeah. So uh, the subject so, is extraordinary, but the act, I guess, is ordinary? That's exactly how I would put it. Yep. So yeah. when you... Yeah, the subject is kind of in an extraordinary mode. Uh, the act is, is yeah. ordinary. So you wouldn't you wouldn't identify the ordinary and universal magisterium as a s distinct subject, and you just subsume no. it underneath. That's right. The, it's, the bishops the are still the subject. Yeah. Uh, so, but this is what leads to the this is what leads to the confusion with uh, the ordinary papal magisterium, because the that original kind of syllogistic argument we were looking at, many theologians felt compelled to say the Pope does have an infallible ordinary magisterium because if he doesn't, it seems like he's has less teaching authority than the bishops, and that seems unfitting. Mm. But in fact, uh, the only reason the Pope doesn't have an ordinary mode of teaching infallibly is because he can't himself be dispersed throughout the world. So the only reason for the bishops having a double mode of infallibility is based on the double possibility of being all united together or dispersed throughout the world. And that's a distinction that you just can't apply to the singular person of the Pope. This next question comes up in your book, and it's definitely something that I would find it helpful if you can clarify for me, because I was recently 
uh, talking to Father Coppice and uh, you know Christian Coppice, and he was uh, he was grilling me on some questions on the magisterium, and, and you never want Father, you know, <laughs> interrogating you because <laughs> he's he's really good. He's he's uh, he knows his stuff, so it, it was it was pretty difficult to answer some of this. And what he was asking is that okay. Uh, would you say that the extraordinary magisterium is identified? One of the ways to identify it is through intention, because the question is, um, if that is the case, does that then mean that there's now a new way to identify, for example, ex cathedra propositions uh, added to the indicators that Vatican I gives, for example? Yeah, good question. I would say no. Uh, I'll try to explain that. So, so the con the criteria given at Vatican I in Pastor Ternos, uh, there are three criteria given. Now, uh, what's what's funny? Not really funny. What what's frustrating uh, is that even the number of criteria given for infallibility is not something agreed upon by Catholic theologians. So you can find uh, very reputable Catholic authors between Vatican I and now who will argue that there are three, others will argue that there are four, others will argue there are five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so so right. it shows you just the level of, right. of disagreement about, about some of these things. Now, right. uh, at Vatican I, the deputation de fide was responsible for drafting the text of Pastor Eternus. The way that works in an ecumenical council, right, is they prepare a text, the bishops read it, they discuss it, they submit their objections and suggested uh, recommendations for alteration and all kinds of things, right? That all comes back to the committee who discusses it internally, prepares a revised draft, and then sends that back out to the general population of the bishops for further discussion, right? So, so that process at Vatican I, when, you, when we get to the definition of papal infallibility, uh, Bishop Vincent Gasser uh, acted as spokesman for the committee that had drafted the document in order to present the final text of the definition to the Council Fathers to explain in, in painstaking detail why they had either accepted or rejected each and every suggested change made to the text and the rationale behind it, uh, exactly how the proposed draft was meant to be understood uh, before the final vote was taken on it. And in so Bishop Gasser at Vatican I gave a four-hour speech, uh, which comprises something like I want to say 80 pages or so in uh, in Mansi, the collection of the acts of the of the Vatican Council. Uh, and in there, he's very clear in a couple of different cases to say to the Council Fathers, in our definition of papal infallibility, we identify three criteria for infallible papal teaching, and they have to do with the subject, the object, and the act of uh, of the teaching, which is another reason why I think that's a helpful way to describe it. Those three things that he uh, mentions are on the part of the subject, the Pope has to be speaking in an official capacity as head of the church, not just as a private scholar. That's one criteria. The second criterion has to do with the uh, object. I'll go out of order here a little bit, but the object has to be a matter of faith and morals. Uh, and the and then the third condition on the part of the act, he says the act has to be the act of defining and not just of teaching. And then what? And then he describes what they mean by that. Uh, he says it, the Pope has to be giving a definitive judgment, or of uh, or he has to be indicating that. Um, well, let me read it for you. I pulled up the quote of what he said. Because uh, even after that first four-hour speech, some questions came back again on this particular point. And so he gave a second explanation of this uh, before the final vote, where he says, indeed, the deputation de fide, the commission, the committee, is not of the mind that this word definition could be understood in a juridical sense, 
so that it only signifies putting an end to controversy which has arisen in respect to heresy and doctrine, which is properly speaking de fide. That's what they don't mean by it. Rather, he says, the word defines, so that condition which is given to us by Vatican I, that the Pope has to be defining doctrine, that signifies that the Pope directly and conclusively pronounces his sentence about a doctrine concerning matters of faith or morals, and does so in such a way that each one of the faithful can be certain of the mind of the apostolic see, of the mind of the Roman pontiff, in such a way indeed that he or she knows for certain that such and such a doctrine is held to be uh, heretical, proximate to heresy, certain or erroneous, etc., by the Roman pontiff. And he says, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to skip to, um, uh, in, in another place talking about the same thing, he says this, um, this intention of the Pope to propose a doctrine in a final, definitive way, not admitting of any possibility of further appeal, is the key note or characteristic of infallible teaching. So, so when we say the intention of the Pope, uh, you have to see the intention of the Pope. That's not an, another criteria than what's given in Vatican II. Looking at the intention of the Pope is the means by which we identify whether he's defining or just teaching. I, I have a couple question, follow-up questions here, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. You know, when, when I'm looking here at the, the definition in Pastor Eternus, so when it says he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church, that part right there, whole church, you're assuming, uh, subsuming that under the indicator um, that he is speaking as the uh in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all christians you're you're uh, so you're putting it under there and not making it a separate in other words the pope can't so, some would say uh, okay you can have a pope defining something but to a local group that doesn't count what you would say is no it, it does count because it's actually to the whole world because it's under his, he's speaking as the Pope, not as a private theologian. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's right. So that is one of the, one of the controversies about how to break down the enumeration of criteria is whether to count that last thing you mentioned to be held by the whole church as a distinct criterion. Now I'll give you, I'll give you two arguments for why that should not be a distinct criterion, but should be okay. uh, understood as contained within or part of the criterion on the part of the subject that the Pope has to be acting as head of the universal church. One reason is because in the official explanation of what's meant by all of this given at Vatican I to the bishops on the basis of which they voted, uh, that's not pulled out as a separate criterion. So that's one indicator. The other is Lumen Gentium. When Lumen Gentium reformulates and represents the First Vatican Council's teaching on papal infallibility, uh, it uh, it, it doesn't say anything about to be held by the whole church. It, it says the Pope is infallible when acting in his capacity as supreme shepherd and teacher. He proclaims by a definitive act a doctrine concerning faith or morals, period. So you've got much more clearly and succinctly three criteria in Vatican II. Now, so then your options are either... Uh, so if there were five distinct or even four distinct criteria given at Vatican I, and now there are only three criteria given at Vatican II, you would have to say that Vatican II has broadened the scope of infallibility tremendously. To say, to say they cut, when you cut down the number of conditions, you broaden the application of, uh, of infallibility, right? If we add more conditions, that's more restrictions. All right. Fewer conditions, fewer restrictions means more papal teaching is infallible. Now, I've never yet seen anybody make the case, even attempt to make the case, that Vatican II was trying to broaden the scope of papal infallibility. Uh, right. If you want to hold that those doctrines are, that the two statements are uh, compatible, that they're both true, then you have to interpret Vatican I in a way where you actually only have three, the same three 
criteria. And again, there's the indication in the acts of Vatican I that that is in fact the right way to do it. So yeah. I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of this. This is a completely random example, but Pope Gregory the 16th in the 18, I, I think I wanna say 1830s, but I'm not sure about that, uh, issued a condemnation of the Baden articles in a letter sent to the bishops of Switzerland. So he's condemning uh, some political uh, theses that had been put forward in Swiss law. So he sent a, a, a letter to the Swiss bishops condemning uh, the Baden articles. But, but the way he says it, he says, in virtue of my uh, supreme apostolic authority, mm -hmm. I declare that these are utterly null and void. So even though he's only communicating directly with a segment of the of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. he's still issuing a, a definitive and final condemnation in his role as universal teacher. So it's no good to say, well, I live in Germany, not Switzerland. And so I'm free to believe that stuff. They just can't believe it in Switzerland. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point there. Um, but OK, so when it comes to intention here, um, you know, one of the indicators that you mentioned there is that he has to define something, but sometimes he doesn't come out and say, I define, you know, he, he doesn't use that language necessarily in all instances. So um, is it the case that one of the ways in which we can determine that he is defining something is through intention, if that intention is made known in some way? Can you, can you hear me, Doc? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, you, you went in and out for a second there, but I think I got the question, which was uh, the Pope almost never, sometimes he does, but popes and councils rarely say we define something. Right. Councils maybe have done that more often than popes. Uh, but, it, but, but nothing hinges on the word. And this came up in, in the Acts of Vatican I as well, because there were uh, a number of bishops who were who were proposing that we ought to put in the text here that the Pope is infallible when he says exactly such and such, you know, when he follows precisely this formula. Uh, and the response that was rejected by the committee drafting the text, and it wasn't ultimately included. And the explanation for that was, uh, was gonna shock a lot of people. So brace yourself. The explanation for that given by uh, the representative of the drafting committee was, uh, the popes have already spoken infallibly, he says, thousands and thousands of times, and there was no formula dictated that they had to use. Mm -hmm. So we can't possibly impose a formula at this stage in the game. Uh, now, the thousands and thousands is what's going to throw people. Um, even I think it's probably fair to say that was slightly hyperbolic. I've never mm -hmm. seen anybody come up with a list of thousands and thousands of infallible statements. It should, however, uh, make you pause and question for a second the common narrative that there have only been two. Um, but his point was, it's not possible to impose a formula uh, on this charism that has existed in the church from, from the beginning. And so he so clarifies specifically, the Pope doesn't have to use any form of words. So it's not, it's not words that we're looking for when we're trying to determine, has he defined something? It's the intention of uh, to use Bishop Gasser's words again, do we see the manifest intention of defining doctrine? And then he explains, what do we mean by that? Two things, either putting an end to a doubt about a certain doctrine, which means if we see that the Pope is intentionally trying to settle a point of controversy or dispute, then if we see he's intending to do that, that's what defining is. We conclude that, okay, he was intending to define. Or uh, giving a definitive judgment and proposing that doctrine as one which must be held by the universal church. So take the assumption of Our Lady into heaven by Pius XII in 1950. That wasn't a huge matter of controversy amongst Catholics. Even the questionnaire he sent out before defining the, do the dogma revealed that this was something believed and taught by most bishops and believed by most Catholics. And that's why he felt free to go ahead and define it as a dogma. But that shows that uh, 
there doesn't have to be, infallibility is not limited to settling doctrinal controversies, but if it's clear that the Pope is trying to settle a matter permanently, he's trying to um, give the final word on a subject, then that's a clear indication of a definition, regardless of whether he uses the word define. And that's the part where he says, rather there is required the manifest intention of defining doctrine, either of putting an end to a doubt about a certain doctrine or defining a thing. That's the, the part you're, you're talking about where Gasser affirms in, intention. Yeah, are, are you're reading probably um, O'Connor's translation, right? Which, mm -hmm. uh, which I actually, it's, it's good, but I would critique it slightly here. I would say that should be translated, there is required the manifest intention of defining doctrine, comma, so now we're going to go on and explain what that means, mm -hmm. either, option one, putting an end to a doubt about a certain doctrine, or option two, it should say here, or of defining a thing by giving a definitive judgment. And O'Connor puts a, a comma in there, defining a thing, comma, giving a definitive judgment, which I just think makes the sense a little less clear. So mm -hmm. there's defining a doctrine by putting an end to a doubt about a certain doctrine, or there's defining a thing by giving a definitive judgment about it and proposing it as one which must be held by the universal church. Now, if we take an example like Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, it's exactly what John Paul II did. He said, in order to end all doubt, I declare that the church has no authority to, uh, to ordain women to the priesthood. And I declare that this judgment must be definitively held by the whole church. Now, if, if you look at what Gasser says as, what are we looking for when we ask, is the Pope defining a doctrine? That's it. Putting an end to doubt giving a definitive judgment and proposing it as one which must be held by the whole church. And and since he did that, you would say that Ordinatio uh, Sacerdotalis there, the proposition that he uh, gives is an act of the extraordinary papal magisterium. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. So I would say it meets the criteria of Vatican I. Mm -hmm. uh, so so Ratzinger would be wrong. I mean, when Ratzinger came out and said otherwise, you you take issue with that, correct? Yeah, absolutely, I do. Uh, so uh, I have the greatest respect for Cardinal Ratzinger, but um, uh, but yeah, I disagree with him on on that point. I think his interpretation of the status or degree of authority of Ordinatio Sacerdotalis uh, is wrong, and and the reasoning he gives for it, I kind of trace out actually the the historical uh, roots of what I think is his mistaken conception about the ordinary magisterium, uh, which I think comes, I mean, this is random trivia, I guess, but I think it comes down to a, a, um, a misreading of, of something Louis Below, Cardinal Louis Below said in his you know, ecclesiastical manual of, um, of ecclesiology back in the early 20th century. So it's, a, it's it's a funny thing with all of these topics, how, again, they're not, the, the, the meaning of these terms are not clearly spelled out in the documents where they're used. So if theologians interpret these terms of ordinary and extraordinary magisterium based on a lot of their own presuppositions, but the fact that we're all using the same terminology often makes us assume that we all understand each other when we're actually often yeah, operating on, on on different presuppositions, so I, I don't, I don't want to like fault Cardinal Ratzinger, but yeah, I, I, I think he's wrong on this. Now, another issue that you talk about in the book, and, and by the way, real, real quick, do you engage the issue there of intention uh, in the um, relatio at any point in here um, in, in the book? Yeah, I do. I, uh, I don't specifically. Uh, address the question that was put to you uh, by uh, by the priest you mentioned. Uh, so, so I don't I don't consider that objection, but I certainly talk about uh, when I'm I, I go into quite a bit of detail examining Bishop Gasser's speech, uh, and he highlights the intention, and so certainly it's discussed there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the Second Vatican Council. Um, 
Um, would you say that it taught certain things definitively that were not previously definitively taught? So new definitive propositions. Some have said that the sacramentality of the Episcopate was one. Would you agree that that's the case? And if so, how do we know that it taught it definitively? What indicators are there in Vatican II that indicate this was definitive? Yeah, okay. Tough question. Uh, let's start with that, with the, the specific case you mentioned of the sacramentality of the Episcopate. Uh, so in, let me see, where is this in Lumen Gentium? Do you remember which paragraph that's in? Oh, it w wasn't in uh, Lumen Gentium to my recollection. I don't have my notes in front of me. It was in uh, one of the other documents. I apologize. No, that's yeah. all right, but I'm pretty sure that one is in Lumen Gentium. Is it? I apologize. So I, I'm, I might be wrong then. I was thinking it was in another one of the documents, but yeah, I, I stand corrected. Well, I haven't wow. found it yet, so I could be wrong too, but um, I'm trying to recall how it phrases it exactly. I think it says the Sacred Council teaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, sounds right. I should have uh, looked it up. I apologize. My com my my research area is over there on that computer, yeah. so I can't yeah, access it. Go. I got it. Thank God for uh, for Control F, right? So right. it's in Lumen Gentium, paragraph twenty one. Okay. Okay. Where it says the Sacred Council teaches that by Episcopal consecration, the fullness of the Sacrament of Orders is conferred. That fullness of power, namely, which both in the Church's liturgical practice and in the language of the Fathers of the Church, is called the High Priest. So, the the criteria for for extraordinary, infallible teaching of an ecumenical council and of a pope are the same. On the part of the subject, it's clear that an ecumenical council has the ability to speak infallibly. So that's a really easy one. Mm -hmm. on, the part, on the part of the object, matters of faith and morals, the sacraments definitely within that realm. So that's pretty easy in this case too. The key question here, the only really important question is, do we see here a definition? Mm -hmm. Namely, do we see any indicators that the bishops were intending to define a doctrine, by which we mean intending to put an end, remove all doubt about a doctrine, put an end to controversy about it, or uh, to give a definitive judgment definitive meaning final right uh, a judgment a final judgment that admits of no appeal uh and frankly to me it's not super clear in that text so i would i would hesitate before i affirmed that that's an infallible definitive judgment now the argument that it is so eves congar for example the the prominent Dominican theologian who was one of the ones involved at Vatican II and wrote um, one of the earliest kind of um, uh, weighty commentaries on Lumen Gentium, kind of magisterial in a, in a um, small M, right? Um, a very influential and important early commentary on Lumen Gentium by a well-known theologian who specialized in ecclesiology and was at the council and influential at the council. So, so his, his commentary on this cover, uh, carried a lot of weight in theological circles. When he discusses this point, he describes this that I just read as a definitive judgment. So if you take his word for it, uh, I mean, if, if he's right that this is a definitive judgment, and then you look at what Bishop Gasser says at Vatican I, what it means to define something, you'd very easily draw the conclusion, well, then this was a uh, definitive, infallible judgment of an ecumenical council. Now, I don't see that in the text super clearly, uh, and I, I, I haven't personally done the research on this, but to give Kangar the benefit of the doubt, right, to, to kind of speak in, um, so I don't have a firm opinion on this myself, but just to give the arguments on both sides. Uh, the way that you could probably argue that this is a definition of Vatican II, infallible definition, is if you said the, the historical context where we know that this question was in fact 
a, a matter of controversy amongst Catholic theologians. There were prominent and respected uh, and reputable Catholic theologians who would argue both sides of this issue. It was, it was, a, it was an open question leading up to Vatican II. You would say the fact that it was a matter of controversy uh, and that the and that the council took a clear stance on it indicates that they were intending to settle the controversy, intending to put the matter beyond doubt. Uh, and and that's what, according yeah. to the Acts of Vatican I, we're looking for. Fine. So I think that in order to make the case, you have to be able to build the case on the basis of the historical background context. I'm not sure myself, oh. not having that, how strong that argument is. Right. Well, I mean, couldn't one offer pushback and just say, well, maybe they're just giving an authoritative but non-definitive answer for now to put it at risk, non-definitively, but at least authoritatively. Yeah, I think you could push back on that. I, exactly, which is why I'm hesitant to accept the force of that argument. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I, I try to keep an open mind since I haven't uh, investigated sure, sure. it so thoroughly myself. But right, Do you, you could imagine that they were trying to sort of temporarily uh, put the matter aside. Mm -hmm. Like, let's stop arguing about this, chaps. Uh, we've got more important things to think about. And maybe a future council or a future pope will give a final judgment on it. Something like that is, would be possible. The one Deep thing I'll say is, is the sacred council teaches mm -hmm. is not the most solemn formulation. There are certainly many, many more ecumenical councils have used much more punchy sure. language than that. But given the style of Vatican II's writing, which mostly avoids phrases like that, to insert there, the sacred council teaches does seem to indicate that um, like an added degree of authority does seem to indicate that they're trying to stress this point. Right. Um, sure. So I think there's something there. Yeah. But I'm but I have a hard time. I'm not convinced. Do you know where uh, Kungar gave his commentary on Lumagentium? The uh, I cite it in the book, so you'll Sorry. find it. Okay. okay. Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'll find it in there. Okay. Yeah, so uh, a few more questions here. Then we got some in the chat that I wanted to get to. You talk about uh, tertiary objects of the magisterium, which is not something we hear about often, right? I mean, we normally hear about primary and secondary objects, but you talk about tertiary objects. Are there su Is there such a thing in your estimation, and what are they? Uh, so I would say no. I, I'm I'm not convinced that there is such a thing as a tertiary object. So I I I, I talk about them uh, in the introduction because what I'm trying to do there is sort of lay out. Uh, I'm trying to give a thorough picture of the diversity of opinion on these things amongst Catholic theologians, and there are theologians who do hold that there is a tertiary object of the magisterium, although they themselves never use that term. So there are theologians who will uh, recognize there's um, there's a primary object of the magisterium, which is doctrines of faith and morals contained in divine revelation. There's a secondary object, which are matters closely connected to the divinely revealed dogmas. And then they say that, uh, and the church can teach infallibly about those, right? So infallibility extends to the secondary object. But then many, many theologians talk about, so this comes up in like controversies over humani vitae, for example, or other moral teaching of the church. There are many theologians. So the common opinion about humani vitae is that it's not infallible, right? Um, not infallible per se. Um, so there are many theologians who will say something like the church is teaching on contraception although it obviously is a matter of morals in a kind of broad sense, right? Uh, and Catholic theologians generally would recognize that the church has the authority to teach about it to some degree. They'll argue that it's not closely connected enough to divine revelation to fall within the scope of the secondary object. But if you've said that it, it, the church does have the authority to teach about it, but it's not closely connected enough to revelation to be in the secondary object, then you've basically described a tertiary object. 
and and so my question was is yeah is there is there such a thing uh i would say that there's not uh i can't i can't cite any church documents that say that so so you'll find the primary and secondary object mentioned in in um uh in various things in the catechism and documents of the cdf um kind of indirectly discussed in lumen gentium and other places nowhere is there ever there's there's no source for a tertiary object in the document of the church, but there's no explicit denial of its existence either. Uh, but my position would be that there is no such thing. If, if something is connected enough to divine revelation for the church to be able to teach about it at all, then I would hold that the church is able to teach infallibly about it, whether or not she actually has. Now, another question here. Would you say that the bishops have to be dispersed throughout the world in order to uh, exercise the ordinary and universal magisterium, or can they do so in an ecumenical council? I would say the former, that they have to be dispersed throughout the world. I would say that on the basis, uh, I, I, would, I would say that because uh, the, the reason why the term universal was even added to that phrase was to specify that we're taught when we use that phrase, we're talking about uh, the magisterium exercised by the bishops dispersed throughout the world. Uh, so I would just I would just say kind of according to the original meaning of that term, which I think is worth kind of being clear on, it'd be inappropriate to describe exercising the ordinary and universal magisterium in an ecumenical council. And then the re the reason behind that. Again, to go back to like the original meaning of that distinction between ordinary and extraordinary as it was understood in the 19th century, the ordinary magisterium was understood to be that teaching of the church which is not contained in ecclesiastical documents, but instead is gathered from scripture the consensus of the fathers the constant teaching of the doctors the preaching of the bishop of, of the church of the bishops and priests and so on now if you have bishops gathered in an ecumenical council and they say something it's in the form of an ecclesiastical document so you just the the, the dynamics of that situation can't create what we mean by ordinary and universal magisterium I hope that helps, but but oh, that's, that's, a, that, that's a knotty problem, and that's like the whole thing that the book is trying to to sort out. Mm -hmm. So I apologize if I can't give a a, a succinct. No, uh, uh, one last one. I want to get to some of the questions in the chat. Um, so, so you're you're doing work here from. Uh, Clayton to the Second Vatican Council. Now, I've heard people bring up that well. Uh, you know, Clayton had a hand in Pastor Eternus and then some other documents. And, you know, his, some of some aspects about him are scandalous. Uh, mm -hmm. He was involved in some scandals. So that somehow impacts the teachings of Vatican I on papal infallibility and something like that, because the the individual partly behind this was involved in some scandals. Could you maybe briefly talk about what all was going on as far as controversies with him and why that does, that's not a refutation to Pastor Eternus? Yeah. So, so Boykin during his lifetime had a, had a sterling reputation was regarded as a, as a very pious and holy priest. Uh, he wrote you know, many works of, of theology that were influential. He, uh, he had a hand in drafting, documents of Vatican I, and also, like you mentioned, uh, possibly some encyclicals of Pope Leo XIII. Um, long after his death, there was kind of a, a scandal uncovered in the Vatican archives. I think this was actually discovered fairly recently. I don't remember the date, but I mean, you know, within our lifetime. I think was when, when John Paul II, right? In his era? Yeah, yeah, I think so, because John Paul II opened up some of the Vatican archives to, yeah. uh, to scholars and so on. Um, and, there, and they discovered that there had been, you know, some controversy which had been hushed up at the time about uh, a, a convent in the vicinity of Rome where uh, Kloitgen was one of the 
confessors for the, for the sisters. So he's one of the priests, not the only one who would go in and hear confessions uh, on a regular basis. And there's a lot of scandalous uh, stuff that came out about that convent. And then, uh, and then some of it uh, uh, fell on Clayton as well. So, um, so the controversy was much broader than just Clayton, but he was definitely wrapped up in it to a certain extent that, um, that to say the least, cast some doubt on his uh, previous reputation for sanctity. Uh, I don't want to go into the uh, X-rated details. Sure. Um, so, 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 but then the question is, okay, does this affect, uh, does this affect the theology? I mean, I think the answer is a pretty straightforward no. That's, that's just a classic sort of ad hominem, the response to anybody's argument by saying what you're saying is wrong because you're not a good person, right? I mean, as a logical fallacy, that's just textbook worthless. Mm. Uh, and that's only talking about Cloyken's own writings. Uh, so uh, it's a whole nother thing to be talking about the writings of Pius IX or of Vatican I, where certainly Cloyken had an influence. Uh, and there's no reason to downplay that. He certainly had an influence. But in the end, uh, Pius IX is the one who sent the letter to the, to the Archbishop of Munich, for example, not Cloyken. And so what Pius IX said in there were things that Pius IX himself was convinced were true for his own reasons. Uh, and Vatican I, even more so, Clayton had a hand in the drafting of some of the documents, but all of the bishops had input into what they should say, and they weren't promulgated as the teaching of the church until the bishops themselves voted on it. So, I mean, yeah, to, to, me, to me, the two are just not connected. Um, Certainly, I would not go around holding up Kloitkin as a as a great example uh, for anybody to follow. But I think his arguments have to be looked at on their own merits, and the teaching of the church has to be received on its own merits. I mean, there have been I don't, um, it it shouldn't surprise anybody to think that like some of the bishops who have been involved in some of the ecumenical councils over the course of history have not been saints and were probably even involved in some scandalous things. Many popes we know have been involved in pretty scandalous things. And we've always been able to separate the, there's the private life of the one teaching, and then there's actually the authority, which is protected by God of the truth of his teaching under certain conditions. So especially like with the solemn judgments of Vatican I, it's like, Look, one of the criteria for an ecumenical council to teach on the faith is not that the people who wrote the documents have to be saints. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we would have to then go and investigate all the fathers at uh, Nicaea one and <laughs> all three hundred and eighteen of them and try to find out their backgrounds and see. That's if right. They, and we know some. We know some of them were saints. But, yeah, but we, we do. But but, they, <laughs> but a lot of it. Be, it wouldn't be shocking if some of them were sinners. We don't even have acts. We don't even know if they wrote acts. But that counts. So, right. uh, here's five a day productions. How does the suppression of the minor orders by Paul VI coalesce with the declarations of Trent? Was this de fide or only related to discipline? Any comments on this? I know it's slightly off topic, but. Oh, gosh. That's not something I know a lot about. So, I'll be very hesitant. Uh, is yeah. the question about Paul VI? So, so the suppression of the minor orders, I'd right. be very confident saying there was nothing doctrinal or dogmatic in that. He wasn't declaring there never have been minor orders. He was much more saying we're not going to use them right now. Mm -hmm. so, so to me, that's pretty clearly a, a kind of disciplinary policy question. I think I think Pope Francis very easily could resurrect the minor orders uh, tomorrow. And in fact, the minor orders uh, do exist uh, in some of the traditional orders of Catholic priests. So, um, so in the priestly fraternity of St. Peter or something like that, the, the, the men are ordained to the minor orders prior to, uh, being ordained to the diaconate and priesthood. At least, uh, at least that's my understanding. I, yeah. I won't claim to be an expert in those things though. Yeah, they, they do. And, and also, you know, Eastern, Eastern Catholics. Um, all right. right. 
uh, could you also explain why you don't believe Vatican II D uh, DH Dignitatis Humani II to be infallible? That this Vatican Council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. Is it for the same arguments, pretty much, that you questioned Lumen Gentium Twenty One? Did I say? Did I say I don't believe that's infallible? I don't remember saying that. Uh, I think there's actually a better case to be made for that one. That that some oh. of that is infallible in Dignitatis Humani. So where it says, um, because again, if you if you look at the kind of so so what is meant by a definition is not clearly spelled out in the text of Vatican I or Vatican II. Uh, we have to look at the at the acta to understand what they meant by it, and we have to look at the kind of tradition of the church. So, so in the case of ecumenical councils, there is a you can see examples through history of what kind of terminology have councils used when they're trying to settle, you know, to definitively settle a controversy. So how did Chalcedon phrase its um, its condemnation of Nestorianism and monophysitism and so on? Uh, and, and some of the terminology um, in Dignitatis Humanae, like in the second part of the first paragraph, it says, first, the council professes its belief that God himself has made known to mankind the way in which men are to serve him and thus be saved in Christ and come to blessedness. Now, a profession of faith from a council is one of the traditional forms of definitive teaching. So I'd be very open. Again, Vatican II is a bit hard, so I, I hesitate to take a firm opinion on this. But I'd be very open to reading that as a, as a definitive infallible teaching. And a little bit further mm -hmm. on, it says, this Vatican Council likewise professes its belief that it is upon the human conscience that these obligations fall and exert their binding force. Mm. Um, the, the kind of the controversial line, if you will, this Vatican Council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. That, again, like that, that language is slightly more solemn than a lot of the rest of Vatican II, this Vatican Council declares. But it's not like incredibly obviously solemn. So that's a similar one where I would tend towards thinking that that is an infallible declaration, but I would hesitate to, I wouldn't die on that hill. In ambiguous cases like this, where it's not always very clear cut as far as the indicators, could reception of the church? You know, over a long time, you know, could could reception be an indicator there? As yeah, I think it, I think it could be. We'd have to be careful that like reception doesn't confer any greater authority on the text than it had. Right. So it so it doesn't have um, uh, ontological value in that way, but it has epistemological value. It can be like exactly like you said. It can be a good indicator for us um, uh, that it was. Um, that it was authoritative, or it could just show that because um, the, the reception uh, is in a lot of ways tied up with the activity of the ordinary magisterium. So the kind of generalized but not documented preaching and teaching and understanding of the faith throughout the world, that's tied up into the ordinary magisterium. So you could have um, something kind of unclear in the, in the documents, which uh, becomes clear later on through the yeah through reception through the ordinary magisterium. One more from, from uh, Elijah, one of our contributors here. Everyone knows that this rule about the consent of the churches in their present preaching is valid only in its positive sense and by no means in its negative sense. This is by Gasser, since you you know brought up the relatio earlier. He's asking, what does that mean? This is something he's always wondered about. What does it mean? Uh, in its positive sense, but not in its negative sense. Can you read it for me one more time? Everyone knows that this rule about the consent of the churches and their present preaching is valid only in its positive sense and by no means in its negative sense. So talk about the consent of the churches. That's a quote from Gasser? Yeah, that's from the Relatio. Yeah, so talking about the reception of uh, definitive teachings. The consent of the churches and its preaching is valid only as a positive sense, not as a negative sense. The way I understood it, I thought that he was basically saying that um, it's a way to identify something 
uh, is definitive, but it's not, it's not going to rule it out. If, if the consent is not there, that doesn't mean it's not definitive, but if the consent is there, that, that could be an indicator that it is definitive. That's the way I took it. I could be yeah. completely off base on that. Your, your reading sounds very plausible to me. I, I'm wondering where in the speech this fall, I can't, I, I don't recall the yeah. quote and I can't think about what the context was offhand. Been a while since talking part. about, so of course the the final clause of the definition of papal infallibility at Vatican I, uh, where it says the Pope is infallible of himself and not from the consent of the church, uh, was kind of included deliberately to exclude the Gallican uh, opinion about papal infallibility. And so, and so I'm just kind of wondering, is that the context he's talking in? In which case, I'm, in which case I'd have to see it in context. Uh, but what you said uh, makes sense kind of in the abstracted from context that uh, the, if the church consents, uh, that means if the church agrees, if the whole church agrees about some doctrine, that is a positive indication that that is something which we believe as Catholics. Yeah. But if there's not agreement about it, you can't take that to say that the church has no teaching on the subject. Right. It's often the case, like the divinity of Christ in the year 318, exactly. it's often the case that there is a dogmatic teaching on something, even yeah. when there's not consensus about it. Uh, right. The church. So, Just because there wasn't consensus at that time doesn't mean that it wasn't, you know, the Right, exactly. Yeah. So I'll compare uh, with you, Michael. I think that's a, a good reading of it. But I, but I'd be curious to see it in context to say for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> now, this one. Um, what are other examples of papal errors aside from John the Twenty uh, Seconds homily in the Beatific Vision? <laughs> it says pre-Vatican II, huh? so I can't talk about Pope Francis, right? Well, we could do post-Vatican II. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't want to get myself in too much right. trouble. Right. <laughs> Pre-Vatican II papal errors. Yeah, okay. So again, not a subject that I'm deeply learned in, I suppose, the, the kind of historical. So my my area of study was really like Vatican I to Vatican II. Um, uh, you know, the, the classic examples that, that the Protestant reformers, for example, uh, typically brought up would have been, what, Liberius and his uh, condemnation of Athanasius uh, was supposed to have subscribed to a semi-Arian creed. Honorius was condemned as a heretic by an ecumenical council. Uh, you'll correct me probably if I'm getting some of these wrong, because I think you know more about this historical uh, patristic area than I do. Um, uh, John the 22nd, the one you mentioned, is certainly uh, one of the most prominent. Am I missing out any good ones, Michael? Julius. <laughs> Virgilius. Oh, yeah, yeah. Virgilius. Uh, uh, yeah, I've had some, a lot of discussions with uh, Eric Ibarra about that one. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a confusing, that's a complicated case. But right, Virgilius looks very much like he went back and forth a couple of times on whether or not the, the three chapters were uh, were orthodox or heretical. Right, yeah, but, and, and he uses some pretty strong language, too. <laughs> yes, yes, he does, yep. <laughs> so another good example of how we can't always use the indicators that we would use today and read it back into something in the 500. So <laughs> yeah, it can be tough. It can be tough with some of those. Um, this is another one here. Um, would Nestorius be an example of where a statement was heretical, even though what Nestorius denied had not yet been defined? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's a great example. That's very much parallel to the case of Arius that I was discussing before. So, uh, so the fathers of the church, as soon as Arius started preaching that Mary is not the Theotokos, uh, Cyril Cyril was condemning him as a heretic. Right? Cyril wasn't saying like, "Well, that's a theological opinion that I personally disagree about," but since the church hasn't defined it, we can agree to disagree. There was none of that. Uh, if if <laughs> because the the, the doctrine of the incarnation, although not as clearly articulated as it later came to be, was believed and understood uh, by, the, by the church, by the fathers of the church and, and so on, 
prior to uh, the Council of, of uh, Councils of Ephesus and, and Chalcedon, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's a great example. And then what about John the Twenty Second? I think was on that question as well, right? Um, right. That one, I would say yes. I would say that's a very parallel case. So so the doctrine of the immediacy of the beatific vision for the saints after death had not yet been defined. But when the John the Twenty Second started preaching that the beatific vision is delayed until the final judgment, even for the saints. Um, it roused a lot of controversy, and there were a lot of private theologians who uh, who said, "Like, no, that's not right. That's a heresy." Uh, so, so theologians called the Pope out for heresy, even though it hadn't been defined, because uh, that doctrine had been uh, sufficiently part of the Church's patrimony, part of the Church's tradition. Where they were, they didn't have this terminology of ordinary magisterium. But basically, you say that was already a dogma in virtue of the ordinary magisterium, uh, and, and the Pope was eventually convinced of that and with, withdrew his heresy uh, on his deathbed. I think. Again, I'm not a historian, so I, if I'm butchering some of the historical details, I apologize. I'm sure, I'm sure somebody will call me out on it in your in your chat box. But. Um. To ask this one too, why couldn't John Paul II's judgment be considered as an action of the ordinary and uni I'm sorry, universal ordinary magisterium defining something, and that's why it's infallible, not because it's extraordinary, but because it's universal ordinary magisterium. So this is this is terminology is everything here. So it's all about what you mean when you use those words, and that's that's been the whole. That's been my whole project is to try to sort out what these words mean in different contexts. So I can just tell you the, the way I understand those words is that ordinary and universal magisterium just means uh, the teaching of the bishops dispersed throughout the world, which is not enshrined in documents. So uh, that just can't, that doesn't apply to, to John Paul II's uh, statement. Now, now I'll tell you, I mean, I mentioned that's not the way everybody understands those terms. So in the book, I, I discuss at least four different ways in which theologians have understood the meaning of those terms. So some theologians think it's extraordinary if it uses really solemn, heavy hitting language, like we declare, define, decree, and possess, you know, anathema sit, you know, if it uses all like the really heavy hitting language, it's extraordinary. And if it just uses normal language, it's ordinary. Well, if that's the way you want to look at it, then you might say that John Paul's statements was ordinary. Or other theologians would say, if it's handing down a traditional teaching, if it's just handing down something we already knew, they call that ordinary. Whereas if it's introducing something new, they call that extraordinary. Now, if that's what you think the terms mean, then you're going to look at that statement in John Paul II and say, well, that's ordinary because that's what the church has always done and held. Uh, other theologians take extraordinary to mean a definition and ordinary to mean absolutely everything else without distinction. So, so that's an interesting one because that's a, like, uh, this is Francis Sullivan, by the way, like he has a, a clear and accurate understanding, I would say, of the extraordinary magisterium. But then he defines the ordinary magisterium only negatively, meaning anything that's not the extraordinary must be ordinary. And he doesn't really find, I think, its essential characteristic. It's only saying what it's not, what it is, not what it is. Uh, and in fact, there are a lot of different kinds of teaching lumped into that view of the ordinary magisterium. And then the fourth alternative uh, that um, Stom authors hold is that. Uh, Anything coming from an ecumenical council is ordinary. Anything coming from the bishops dispersed throughout the world, sorry, I said that wrong. Anything from an ecumenical council is extraordinary. Anything coming from the bishops dispersed throughout the world is ordinary. Uh, and that comes close to the to view I was defending, but of course it would leave all the teaching of Vatican II as extraordinary. If I've just confused everybody, that was partly my intention, because my point is that uh, theologians use these terms differently so how you determine what you think about ordinatio sacerdotalis is all about what you think those terms mean. And what I think ordinary universal magisterium 
means is the definitive teaching of the bishops dispersed throughout the world, uh, but not in the form of ecclesiastical documents. Since that's what I think ordinary universal magisterium means, that's why I would not agree with the way it was put in the question. When you say not in ecclesiastical documents, you mean not definitively in one place, because clearly the proposition would be somewhere in a bishop's catechism or something in, in a document. Yeah, that's that, right. That, that's a great question. So let me clarify that a little bit more. The, the ordinary and universal magisterium in the 19th century understanding, in the Vatican I understanding, is the teaching of the church, but not found in a document of the church. So, so you will find it as the teaching of Bishop X in the documents of Bishop X, but you can't point to, um, think of the analogy of the, the consensus of the church fathers. Okay, so part of Catholic doctrine is that if the church fathers are unanimous in their interpretation of scripture, that Catholics are not permitted to disagree with this, right? So we hold that the church fathers are infallible when they uh, unanimously agree on the interpretation of scripture. So, um, but no individual church father is infallible, right? So you can't, you can't point to a text in a church father and say, look, the church teaches this. I would say, no, that St. Augustine teaches this. St. Athanasius teaches this, but show me the church teaches this. To show me that the church teaches it, you'd have to show me all the church fathers. And then I'm making an inference, which is that if all of those held up to us by the church as the authoritative fathers agree on something, then I'm inferring that there the church herself teaches the same thing. So it's similar with the ordinary magisterium. You can't point to a text anywhere and say, this here is the teaching of the church through the organ of the ordinary magisterium. My position is that that's impossible, uh, but that doesn't mean it's undocumented at all. So you would be looking at texts of scripture, you would be looking at texts of the church fathers, you would be looking at texts of the bishop, but the only way you'd be able to identify that, in fact, what we have here is not just the teaching of a bishop or a father, but the teaching of, of the church, is when you see the unanimous consensus. So the infallibility of the ordinary magisterium is an infallibility derived from or inferred from the universal consensus of individually fallible teachers. Whereas the extraordinary magisterium is something very different. The teacher, in the case of the extraordinary magisterium, is per se infallible. Whereas Dr. the ordinary magisterium is universal consensus. Now, um, I don't see any any others in the chat um, that pertain to this specifically, so we'll leave it there. Dr. Joy, I appreciate you coming on so much and answering this. This has clarified so much. And as I continue to go through this, I'm going to have more questions. So I'd love to have you on to talk more, a, a part two on your book, if you're willing. Uh, My pleasure, Michael. Anytime. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's always fun to talk to you. I, I really enjoy it. It helps so much, and I, I know it's helping uh, the viewers as well. Everybody go check it out, Amazon.com. Let me zoom in on it a little bit there. On the Ordinary and Extraordinary Magisterium from Joseph Kloitken to the Second Vatican Council, Dr. John Joy. I have a link in the description, so just click on it, get you a copy, read it. Like I said, the introduction alone is worth it. Read the introduction and the conclusion, as Dr. Joy said, and, and that will really... Uh, give you a good understanding of the magisterium. And then, of course, you can read everything in between to get all the details. So go and check it out. Dr. Joy, again, thank you for coming on. Always a pleasure. You're welcome. Everybody, thank you for watching. I appreciate your participation there in the chat. Don't forget to comment, like, subscribe. Tell your friends about us. Help uh, help us uh, you know, get the information out there and our name uh, out there. Tell them to subscribe as well. And check us out at reasonandtheology.com or patreon.com forward slash reasonandtheology if you would like to support us. Until next time, God bless.